Prohibition Partners TV with Lindsay Hooper. Hello and thank you very much for joining us again for another one of these interviews brought to you by Prohibition Partners, all in the build-up to our big event in June on the 22nd and 23rd, Prohibition Partners Live. And we think it's very important that you also get to hear from an investor in this industry so that we can shed a light on those matters. Uh, can welcome into the conversation Alan Brockstein. Uh, Alan, thank you very much for joining us today. It's great to be here, Lindsay. Thanks for including me. Alan, would you be able to run through for us, just to start us off, your involvement and how you came to be part of what is the cannabis industry now? Uh, sure. Yeah, I was uh, an independent equity analyst back in 2013. I kind of stumbled onto the sector and uh, I ended up launching later that year 420 Investor, which is a community of people interested in the publicly traded stocks. And I continue to run that to this day. And then uh, a couple of years later, I formed with my partner, New Cannabis Ventures, which is a leading uh, financial portal uh, for people interested in cannabis business news. So the first one's a subscription business. The second one's open to the public, supported by advertising. What really got your attention when you came across all of the work that's been done? A couple of things. Uh, first of all, well, three things. First, uh, I wasn't even aware that cannabis had been legalized in the United States. I should actually say, that uh, it was marijuana, it wasn't cannabis at the time. And so Washington and Colorado had legalized, I missed it. I also missed that there were publicly traded companies and that's kind of where my uh, expertise intersected with what had always been a lifelong interest of mine from a, a political standpoint and as, you know, in the past as a consumer as well. Uh, and so I, I started uh, looking into the space and the companies back in 2013 that were publicly traded were these uh, penny stock scams. And so I was able to uh, really expose a lot of them, learn about the industry and uh, get up to speed on not, not only the medicinal properties, but also, you know, the real companies in the industry. And uh, it's been brilliant the way it's played out. There has been a lot of coverage, I think in particular over the last 12 months, a lot of people saying that there's a lot of hype around this industry. Is it to be believed? So of course there's a lot of hype, right? I mean, just like every uh, big fad that comes along, uh, you, you get investors that get overly optimistic and you get people that try to capitalize uh, on the opportunities. I, I say uh, uh, opportunity breeds opportunists, but uh, this is a very real industry. And I think you need not look any further than what's been going on just in the last couple of months post pandemic. Uh, you know, we've gone from being a very highly stigmatized industry uh, that, you know, formerly was in, in the black market in the shadows. And now it's an essential services uh, in many states, not everywhere. And I think that says a lot. I think uh, one of the big milestones for the industry and, you know, many people don't really consider GW Pharma to be in the industry because they went through the FDA path. But this is extremely important that the, the FDA has approved a cannabis derived drug. It means so much because it conflicts with what the federal government formally says about cannabis, that it has no medical benefit and that it's dangerous. So we've had a sea change in the way people approach things. And here in the United States, it's a state by state process. I'm not really looking for federal legalization anytime soon. I sure would like to see some of the potholes removed to use a pun. Uh, there are a lot of roadblocks uh, to state uh, state legal cannabis being more uh, widely adopted. But if you look at the political uh, polling, uh, I'd say nine out of 10 people is what I usually see in these surveys that support medical cannabis. It's very hard even for somebody who's extremely religious or who would oppose cannabis use uh, for uh, adult use or recreational purposes to, to be against mm. it for medicinal purposes. So we've already won that battle 90%. You can't get people 90% of people to agree on anything. But even when it comes to whether or not states should legalize uh, the majority, uh, e even across the other party, the majority of people uh, are in favor of legalization for whatever reason. 
as you say, a lot of work being done in the medicinal area, but also beauty is a, a growing trend, as well as I was speaking to Alexandra from Prohibition Partners in one of these interviews, who was talking to me about pet food. So are there short term mm -hmm. investment opportunities for people? So I, I think that those are, are great applications. Uh, I think, unfortunately, a lot of the kind of promotionalism and opportunism that I see comes from those really highly specialized areas. So I, I think they're great opportunities. It's really early. With that said, there was a, a primarily uh, cosmetic focused uh, company. Uh, I'm, I'm remembering not the brand right this second, but the company is called Redwood. And uh, they sold to Kronos Group for $300 million. Lord Jones is the brand. Now, that was a brand that went across, uh, across uh, the CBD and THC divide. They just sold the CBD part, if I recall, mm -hmm. to Kronos Group, or that's all they're using it for right now. And that's a high-end, cosmetic-focused uh, brand. So I, I don't want to naysay that. I, just, I suggest that there's so many applications, and investors better be careful about companies that are trying to be so narrowly focused. Yes, I mean, in your opinion, what should people look at first before they invest? Yeah, well, so I, I've been spending a lot of time the last few months because historically, while I thought about these things, it really wasn't that relevant. And what I've been thinking about was all the different subsectors. And in the past, all these stocks have gone up and down similarly. So it didn't really matter. Now, there's so many different uh, constraints on the market, mainly uh, capital uh, crunch as being one. But even when you look within these subsectors, which the capital crunch would weigh on those, the, the subsectors themselves are moving very differently. Uh, our market was really jump started by legalization in Canada, which has not really lived up to its expectations, not even close. While in the United States, the state legal cannabis companies have been doing better than people expect, uh, just uh, surging forward without uh, all the capital being thrown at them the way the Canadians were. So, you know, there's now a divergence between the Canadian Canadian companies and the U.S. companies. Even within the U.S., you know, we're seeing some tiering among the very largest and the and, and the not very largest, where the the very largest have cemented uh, uh, a stronghold on access to capital, whereas the ones right behind them are really struggling. And then there's a third tier that's not quite as complex. Uh, so many of these companies tried to rule the world. Well, in the United States, they tried to rule the United States. The Canadian LPs tried to rule the world. So it's kind of an interesting juxtaposition because right this moment, mm. when I look at the Canadian market or what I've been saying the last few months, is the very largest Canadian operators are not the best investments. They're the, the most known. They have They've had the best access to capital in the past, but they have spread themselves too thin with uh, cost structures all over the world. And so we're seeing some retrenchment uh, from all these players. In the United States, it's a little bit different. The very largest companies are separating from the pack. They have access to capital, whereas the others don't. When you look at the revenue of all these companies, whether they're in Canada or the United States, it, is, it blows my mind that even though it's federally illegal in the United States, these leading operators in the United States are actually putting up higher levels of revenue than these Canadian companies where it's federally legal. Now, the United okay. States is a bigger market, but it's not 100% legal. You even have one company that derives all of its revenue from Florida, or almost all of it, that's doing mm -hmm. more revenue than most all of these Canadian LPs. So I think you, you really need as an investor to understand capital constraints, regulatory constraints, and uh, all sorts of other issues that are impacting the market right now. So US federal legislation, do you think that will happen in the next 12 months? No, I, I really don't. And uh, what I always like to tell people is don't worry, you don't need that to be successful in your investment thesis. As a matter of fact, uh, you should maybe fear it because if they were to quickly federally legalize, Procter & Gamble would be selling joints. So uh, that's not really the best uh, outcome. I think the best outcome that we can get is status quo. Status quo has enabled a lot of companies to build uh, intellectual property, establish branding, get customers, get a lot of traction in the market. And uh, so my own outlook on federal, the federal policy is we don't want to see any sort of shift back to where the federal government is fighting it. 
But right now, the mm -hmm. federal government realizes, I mentioned earlier, this conflict. On the one hand, the, the, the scheduling tells you there's no medical benefit, but a federal agency has approved a cannabis-based drug. So they're dealing with that. They're dealing with the realities of this industry. They, people like to say the genie's out of the bottle. And I, I think that's pretty true. But the reality right mm -hmm. now is there are some barriers from federal illegality. And I think they need to address those first before making it federally illegal. And those barriers that come to my mind are number one, the inability to do research. If you're a federally funded uh, organization, you wanna do cannabis research in the United States, you risk your federal funding. So that's one. Two, banking. So there's a whole, there are a whole bunch of different levels of the lack of financial services being provided. Uh, there's, so it's hard to borrow, but even beyond that, just the simple cash depository, uh, this creates an incredible risk to the people working in the industry because of the cash that's being out there. It, it creates inconvenience. Like during this pandemic right now, where a lot of people don't want to touch cash anyway, or where we're shifting to delivery, even in states that have never formally allowed delivery, but they're doing it because it's an essential service and they want, you know, states have an incentive tax revenue, right? Uh, mm -hmm. So we are seeing more interest now at the federal level of, of moving forward some legislation that it would at least give safe harbor to companies to accept deposits. I'd love to see a, a letter written to Visa, MasterCard, et cetera, saying you can process cannabis transactions as long as you follow these rules. This would be a game changer and it doesn't require federal legalization. Federal legalization is very complex a lot of work has to be done. All you have to do is look back to the legalization in Canada, which had a federally legal medical program that took a long time. And then on top of it, the adult use program as well to, to, to go to that next level uh, took a lot of time. So federal legalization, mm -hmm. I think, you know, if we move in that direction, it's, it's actually a negative. Although I would imagine you'd have a lot of people interested in the existing companies without necessarily recognizing that. So I'm prepared for if we move in that direction. I don't think we will, though. Some excellent suggestions there from you for people to take away. As you know, Prohibition Partners Live, due to COVID-19, has been forced to go online. It will be a 48-hour global national global event. I say global national, global event, uh, where we are hoping to get many more investors who, who check it out. Do you think there's going to be a benefit, Alan, from actually taking this online instead of being at an event in the centre of London this time? Well, so I think uh, I, I come from an investor uh, perspective and uh, I've been to a lot of trade shows. I've been to a lot of conferences. Uh, for me, it's actually hard to get out, but I'm trying to think about your audience. So for a trade show, I think it's more important to be there in person. For investors, you know, uh, this has been going on for more than a decade. Pe investors love the opportunity to hear directly from companies and you don't have to be there in person. So uh, this is nothing novel at all. Uh, so I, I'm kind of excited about this because as much as I'd like to go to the UK, it would be hard for me. Uh, I'm going to get a chance to uh, present and I think interact a little bit uh, with the audience as well. And I would say for investors out there, this is going to be a, a good opportunity to learn about the big picture for the industry as well as mm -hmm. maybe some of the nuts and bolts. We've loved hearing from you and you've given us a little glimpse and insight to what to expect in June at the event. Thank you very much for your time. You as well. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. So Alan Brockstein. And we will have more of these interviews to come for Pro Prohibition Partners. And you can also buy early bird tickets to the event on June the 22nd and 23rd by visiting the website prohibitionpartners.live. And we'll see you again soon. Be part of the conversation at Prohibition Partners Live, 22nd to 23rd of June, the premium online cannabis industry conference.